evening, everyone. Now, we often like to pray to be able to hear God. But what if what we hear from God is something we do not like to hear? Now, some people, they dare not pray because they know it in their heart that perhaps what God is going to tell them is going to be against their will. So what do we do when what we hear from God is not aligned with what we want to hear or what we hear from God is something very hard to do. Now, of course, if we hear from God something that supports our plan, we'll be very happy and we'll be very quick to go and implement our plans. But what if what God tells us is really very hard to accept? Do we then you know, pretend that, oh, we never hear it from God? Maybe we hear wrongly. We need more time to confirm. Uh, maybe God is not speaking to us so, or we hear wrongly. Or sometimes when we hear from God and it doesn't fit our wishes, we tend to procrastinate. We want to put it one side. We want to ignore it. We want to do other things first and then we just don't want to think about it. So what is your usual response when you hear something from God that is not fitting to your will? And today we will look at Moses' response. Now, if you recall the last time, a few sessions, we talk about God commissioning Moses to a very heavy mission, to something very difficult for Moses to do. And Moses argued with God, no reason with God, gave him five reasons why you know I cannot do it. And last week, uh, not last week, the week before, we also shared about how God help Moses to know him better, that he is not just a God like any other gods or idols, but he is a God who claims to be I am who I am. So now after knowing God better and after getting the mission from God, what is Moses' next course of action? And this is the question we need to ask ourselves also. You know, sometimes we come to church. We say we want to come to church. We want to know God better. We read the Bible. We say we want to know God's will. And when we pray, we want to say we want to hear from God. But so after God reveals to us, what do we do after hearing from God? So let's read Exodus chapter 4, verse 18. So as we go along, we will explain God's word and what are the things he wants us to to learn through his passage today. So Exodus chapter 4, verse 18. Then Moses went back to Jethro. So after hearing from God, after you know reasoning with God, and after God uh, telling Moses, uh, Moses that he is the I am God, Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Did anyone find Moses' words to the father-in-law a bit strange when you read this verse? Now, is this the reason why God asked Moses to go back to Egypt? Is it just to see whether any of his family member, any of his own people is still alive? This is not exactly what God told Moses to do. So perhaps at this point, why is Moses only telling his father-in-law, you know, God just want me to go and check out whether my own people are, are alive or not? Perhaps just like sometimes when we hear from God, although we hear from God, we still have certain uncertainty. We are not so sure uh, of what will happen if we really follow God and go back to uh, and go to where He wants us to go. So at this point, perhaps Moses is a bit torn. He knew very clearly God wants him to go back to Egypt, but he's not very sure what would happen there. So he just says something very vague, very conservative. Or perhaps you know uh, Moses at this point he may feel slightly embarrassed to tell his father-in-law what a grand mission God has given him, you know, because to the father-in-law, Moses is just a, uh, someone who ran away, you know, ran for his life and seeking refuge with the father-in-law. is now a, a worker or a son-in-law at Jethro's place. So he may feel very embarrassed. How can someone so insignificant be called to such a grand mission? It is like sometimes, although we hear from God's word, we know we are dignified in God. We know God has great mission for you and I. We know we are supposed to fulfill God's um, plans of salvation. But sometimes we feel a bit embarrassed, you know, to tell our non-believing friends and family that, you know, God can use me greatly. We are so afraid that people will laugh at us, especially people who know us very well. You know, God can use you greatly. Look at you, you are not very significant. You have so much inadequacies. And so perhaps at this moment, Moses is a bit apprehensive or he's a, a, a bit embarrassed. But the key point for us to note here is what? Is even though sometimes we are like Moses, we can be unsure. But being unsure doesn't mean that we stop obeying God. So the point here to note is even when we are unsure. So when I say unsure is 
uh, we are unsure of the outcome. It's not we are unsure of God's will. Of course, if you are unsure about God's will, of course, we need to um, pause a while, make sure, double check that th this is really what God wants us to do. But for Moses, it's very sure. God is very clear about what God wants Moses to do. So for us, when we are very sure God wants us to do something, but we are just not sure what's the outcome, nonetheless, we still should obey God, even when we are not sure what will happen. And the amazing thing is, as we still obey God, despite our insecurity, God, He will convince us along the way. As we submit to God step by step, God will reveal to us certain evidences that reaffirm you know, our faith that submitting to God is the right path to take. And so in fact, today, the whole account that we're going to read is about how Moses responds to God's mission in obedience. And that's why he really get very practical. He now set out on a return journey back to Egypt. And so in the same way, when we asked the previous question we started during this sermon, what do we do after encountering God, after hearing from God, is after God spoke to us, God expects an immediate follow-up obedience. So we cannot remain in a state of indifference, inaction, after hearing from God. And so that's why Moses, straight away, after uh, talking to God, he straight away go and take leave from his father-in-law. And so Jethro's response is one. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. And then verse 19, Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt. For all those who wanted to kill you are dead. And so Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Now notice some amazing reaffirm reaffirmation here in these two verses. When God wants us to do something, what does God do also? He opens way. So just imagine, although uh, in this passage, Jethro's reply is very short. No, uh, uh, go, I wish you well. It's very short, one sentence. Uh, to signify his blessing to Moses. But you just think about it. If you are Jethro, is it so easy to just say go? You know, now this, this father-in-law, this Jethro, he has to, you know, he has to be able to part with his uh, beloved daughter, his grandsons, and then he has also to give up this very diligent worker, Moses. It's not so easy to just do that. And not just that, uh, being a father and knowing that his son-in-law came from where? The son-in-law came from uh, running from his life from Egypt. So this father, naturally, he will worry. You know, if my daughter, my son-in-law, my grandchildren is to follow my son-in-law back to this dangerous place, Egypt, will my daughter and, son, uh, and grandchildren also face danger? So, of course, he will have hesitation. But yet, God facilitates um, God facilitated Jethro's reply and he made Jethro agree very readily and even gave Moses the blessing to go back to Egypt. So sometimes as we want to follow God, you know, we also worry about our family members. You know, when I want to be a full-time staff, the, the one person's response that I worry most about is my mother, you know, whether my mother will say, what about my allowance, money allowance, or my mother will say, you know, what's your future like? But when God wants us to do something, he opens the door. And also another amazing thing when you can look at that verse, God not just make Jethro agree readily to release Moses and, and the wife and sons, but God also said one very reassuring thing to Moses. And what is that? All those who wanted to kill you in Egypt, they were all dead. Now just think about the timid Moses when he argued with God. Having heard this from God, he would feel so much more settled to go back. And so we can also confirm for our own life. You know, when God wants us to do certain things, do we confirm that God indeed opened doors, opened ways for us, and He smoothens the process? And well, of course, when we hear God making ways, God smoothens the process, this all sounds very good. And this is exactly what we expect of God when we pray to Him, right? When we pray to God, our usual human expectation is, God, this is what you want me to do, right? So I expect you to open doors, remove obstacles, and so that I can fulfill your missions very smoothly. But then, although it sounds very good, we know that that doesn't happen all the time. Yes, there are times when God facilitates and God smoothens the process. But there are also times where, you know, after doing God's will, the strange thing is, we do God's will, but we still face problems. We still encounter resistance. So verse 21, what did God tell Moses next? 
So verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So here we see one important thing that God is preparing his servant Moses for what is going to happen. Now, usually when we uh, set out to do God's will, what is it that you expect from God? The common sense of man is when we set out to obey God and do his will, we will naturally expect that we will have success, right? We will have good outcome since we are doing what God asks us to do, right? So we will say that, no, since uh, I'm obeying God, I'm submitting to God, God should be with me and everything will go smoothly. And we often like to hear God telling us, do not be discouraged. I will hand your enemies over to your hand. And now we like to hear all these things and we find courage. But that is not necessarily the case. But we need to understand that even when we encounter bad outcomes, it doesn't mean that God has failed. For this case, God, he already knew that Pharaoh will not yield to God. No matter how much miracles or whatever uh, things Moses told Pharaoh. But it is not that God has failed to win Pharaoh's heart over. So we must be very uh, clear about what is uh, considered failure. You know, a lot of times when we pray and things still remain ugly, uh, things still re remain uh, messy and things are still not smooth, then we define this as it's a failure of God to answer our prayer. But we need to be very clear. To God, what is failure? Here, even though the Pharaoh's heart will still be hardened and he will not let God's people go, it does not mean that God has failed to win Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart over. Why? Because in the first place, it is not God's intention to win over Pharaoh's heart because God already knew how sinful Pharaoh will be. And God also had a follow-up plan that after Pharaoh defied God, God had a plan to judge and punish Pharaoh and the entire Egyptian army. And so now this is what God is telling Moses. Now just imagine if you are Moses, what would your attitude and your heart be? Now none, none of us like to take up a mission that is bound for failure, right? We like to take up a mission and God says, you go, you know, I will, I'm behind your back. Uh, whoever is against you, I will remove them. And whoever supports you, uh, I will send people who support you to you. You know, we like to hear all these things. But who likes to be sent on a mission that is bound for failure, inverted commas, not real failure, but failure, you know, and a lot of challenges. But the learning point for us here is, although the outcome may be bad, we still need to obey God and not just obey God, obey God all the way. Now notice God's instruction to Moses is very specific. God did not just tell Moses to perform the wonders I've given you the power to do. There's one critical, critical word in this verse for those who are observant when you read the Bible. And the, okay, it's already there, it's the all, all the wonders. So amazing thing is, God specifically tell Moses, you do not just obey me halfway, no. obey me all the way, even though you did not find encouraging results along the way. And God is very smart. He really knows human hearts very well because God knows us. He knows that you know we tend to give up halfway when we didn't see any result. Just think about you know your reaction to the things that you are doing or the things that God asks you to do. You know, when we didn't see any positive results, we are very tempted to not go all the way to and to not finish the course. Maybe we just obey a little bit, but if we see no results, we then U turn. So you know how many times we try to evangelize to our friends, our relatives, we try, we test water, we try to evangelize. But then does it mean that if we try once to evangelize to them and they say, no, 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 I don't want to believe your God, then we stop. We don't we don't try again. I mean God's point is even though yes, as we do certain things for God and we may face certain resistance, but we still need to obey all the way. And but we humans we tend to like to ask, you know. What's the point of doing so much if it's going to fail anyway? And so God is training us through the, the story of Moses to trust in God's wise reasons and perfect timing. So in fact, we need to understand, why did God tell Moses what he told him in this verse? Now, usually you want to ask someone to do something, right? You try to encourage, can I, can I, you can do it one, can I, can I, it's not so difficult. You know, usually we try to, especially to a resistant person already. Now, 
Moses, he's not a very willing um, servant to, to start with. He's a lot of, he has a lot of hesitation. So why did God so strange? Why did God, you know, telling this very hesitant Moses the challenge, the huge challenge ahead of him? So we really need to understand what is, what is God's point of telling Moses such a huge challenge? God does not mean to discourage Moses by telling him Pharaoh's response. In fact, God is trying to encourage Moses. Now, you, you cannot understand, right? How he's, how he's telling me that the task ahead is so difficult, very encouraging. But God is trying to tell Moses that, yes, you will meet with, you will meet with obstacles and resistance, but you have to press on no matter what. And so you just imagine, if God didn't tell Moses, if God didn't prepare Moses' heart beforehand, I believe that perhaps Moses, after carrying out the third or fourth plagues, the miracle, he would just stop and say, I don't have to go until the tenth plague. What's the point? You know, I tried one, two, three miracles, and this Pharaoh doesn't seem to work on Pharaoh. His heart is so hardened. Now, if God didn't um, prepare Moses beforehand, he wouldn't be able to hold out until the last plague. And then he wouldn't be able to witness the most wonderful miracle of all times. And so, God knows us, again I say, when he tells us of certain problems, certain challenges ahead, he meant for us to persevere, to press on, not to give up. And so Jesus told his disciples similar things as what God told Moses here, right? So when Jesus uh, taught his disciples, Jesus also told his disciples what? You must be prepared. If you are my disciples, you must be prepared that the world will hate you because they first hated me. You must be prepared that as you uh, strive to live a godly living, you will face persecution. So Jesus is very clear about that. He's not hiding the fact. So uh, our God is very, uh, how to say, very transparent. He tells us what blessings we have in him, but he also tells us what are the challenges, what's the cross we need to bear in following him. But in, in the same light, when God told us this, at least it makes us stronger. You know, it makes us prepare, prepared to face the oncoming enemy. And so that's why, just as Moses, he's not, supposed to, he's not supposed to stop performing the miracles just because Pharaoh refused to budge plague after plague. So in the same way, as we try to live out God's will, as we try to follow God and we didn't see any fruits, God is telling us we need to brace ourselves for spiritual battle. God is trying to tell us that being follower, follower of Christ, we cannot be very naive to think that the battle is going to be very easy. I mean, true holiday time for us believers will start when we go to heaven. But right now on earth, it is not holiday time. It is better time. So it, it is true, as we reflect upon our uh, faith journey, we will see that, you know, sometimes our efforts to try to convince people and turn them to Christ seems futile. You know, sometimes our kind words our words of blessings fall on deaf ears. You know, people just ignore us. They reject whatever we are saying. They take our words very lightly. But despite what, despite whatever the case, you know, sometimes we try to bless people with the gospel. But all we, all we receive is retaliation, persecution. But nonetheless, God wants us to keep on laboring, keep on believing. Remember this too. Keep on laboring for the Lord. Keep on doing what God wants us to do. And keep on believing that God is still in control. And at the end, as what we read in the responsive reading just now, God will prove to us that all our labor in Christ will not be, put, will not be in vain because God, He knows what He's doing. And so here, God tells us, even when we face problems, even when we face resistance, we still press on to obey Him, whatever it takes. And so next, after knowing the importance of obedience, we see something, we, we, we realize or we read something very strange in the earlier verses also. Because we hear, we read this thing, we read, uh, we read in verse 21 that says, I, meaning God, will harden Pharaoh's heart. So this is something that is very confusing to human minds because usually we, in our common sense, will be wondering, why is it that God, he's the one who hardens people's heart? And yet, he's the one to punish those whom he hardened. It doesn't make sense, right? It's like, so it, it, this verse 21, 
I will harden Pharaoh's heart. This generates a lot of discussion about God's sovereignty versus human responsibility, about whether God is just, whether he is fair, whether, he's, uh, whether he has the right to judge someone, to judge sinners, if in the first place, he is the one who hardens people's heart. Now, so this is one of the verses that we struggle a lot, right? Because we don't understand, God, you are the one who hardens and who can resist your will. But why is it that when you harden, and yet the sinners have to pay the price? So before we reach the conclusion that, yeah, God seems to be blamed you know, for being so unjust in his judgment and punishment, we need to really understand what is meant by God hardening men. So we need to be very clear in our understanding of this. So I don't know what is your understanding of God hardens men. So first, when we talk about God hardens the heart of men, we really need to understand and believe that it is not the case where you know, God generates evil in a good person's heart. So, it is, so here, when we say that God hardens a person's heart, it does not mean that so, so it, means, it, it means that God does not make a sinless, God does not make an innocent person evil. So that's not the case. And so we really need to look into this verse and consider its essence. So when God, so, so therefore, when God hardens a person's heart, for example, Pharaoh in this case, we need to note that there is no contradiction in God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart versus Pharaoh's own wish. So if you continue to read the book of Exodus, you will come across certain verses that says that Pharaoh himself hardens his heart. So when we say that God, when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, we are not saying that God is doing something against the wish of Pharaoh. What Pharaoh wants to do already on his own does not contradict God hardening uh, Pharaoh's heart. And so when we say that God hardens man's heart, a person's heart. It simply means what? It simply means that God is withholding his grace to soften that person's heart. And in other words, God, in withholding his grace to soften that person's heart, God is in fact giving the person over to his own hardened state, to his own sinful heart and mind. And so that's what we read in Romans chapter 1, right? When, uh, when men suppress the truth of God, God just give them over to their depraved mind. And so by hardening a person's heart, that hardening is what? That hardening is in fact God's judgment on the sinner who rejects God. But at the same time, when God hardens a person, it's not just a form of judgment. It is also done to glorify God himself. Uh, so just now we read also in res responsi responsive reading, you know, um, God told Pharaoh, you know, I raise you up for this day so that the whole earth will one day proclaim my name. It's for his glory. But then you, 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 you ask, how is hardening Pharaoh's heart glorifying for God? Now, we need to understand in the ancient time, right, in the ancient Egyptian times, the Pharaoh is deemed as someone very supreme. So nobody can master, nobody can control the Pharaoh, much less his heart. Nobody can control the Pharaoh's heart. Only the Pharaoh himself can control, can, can do what his heart wants to do. But when God says, I can harden Pharaoh's heart, that means what? That means that God can do whatever he wants with Pharaoh's heart. And that highlights the extent of God's control. God can even control. You know, a lot of times, um, we ourselves, we will say, I cannot even control my heart, right? Sometimes we say, oh, I have the heart to do it, but I just cannot do it because I cannot control my heart. And sometimes when we pray for our family members, we say that, oh, yeah, we really want our family members to be blessed, but we cannot control their heart, their response to God. How I wish I can change their heart so quickly and then turn them to God. So nobody can truly control a person's heart. But here, it says that God, he can control the Pharaoh's heart. He can control even the most powerful king, the most powerful ruler of his era, and that is Pharaoh. He can even control 
Pharaoh's heart. And that glorifies God. That shows how much, you know, God, he has, how much control he has over human beings, how much authority he has, how much he's above mankind, even the strongest ruler on earth, even the most powerful king, he can override. And the more hardened, uh, or rather the more stubborn Pharaoh's resistance is, after that, when God has victory over this stubborn uh, Pharaoh, all the more it highlights the extent of victory that God has. So when so in hardening Pharaoh, we also see that God not just judge Pharaoh, he also wants to highlight his glory, how powerful, how he was so much more powerful than this Pharaoh. And so when we talk about God hardening people's heart, I know sometimes uh, we humans, we are trapped by our own conscience, our own sense of justice. We will be thinking, how can God be fair? You know, he hardens a person's heart. He didn't, and then he, and then he go and punish that person, that person. But one thing we need to be very clear is, God owes no sinner any mercy. This is something we really need to bear in mind. Now, if we are not sinner, perhaps, yes, God owes it to us to bless us. But every man is sinner. So as long as we are sinner, God owes no sinner any mercy. And so when God withholds his mercy from a sinner, he is not being unjust. He's just doing what he's supposed to do, judge the sinner. And But on the other hand, it is also amazing because our God is a God who owes none of us any mercy, any salvation, right? But yet the amazing thing is, while he hardens some people's heart, like while he hardens Pharaoh's heart, he withholds his mercy from Pharaoh. But yet, this same God who owes us no salvation, he bothers to save us. And he comes to us and he turns our hearts to him. This is something we need to be thankful for. And so again, God truly um, exhibits that he is whom he said to be. He said, I am who I am. And just now we read from uh, Romans, God says, and because I am who I am, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And so it is truly out of God's mercy, out of God's grace that he chose Israel as his son. And he, choose, he chooses you and I as his children. So next we read, we can re, uh, read on to verse 22. And verse 22, then say to Pharaoh, this is what God says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I tell you, let my son go, so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, and so I will kill your firstborn son. So there's this verse God says to tell Pharaoh, Let my son go, so what? So that he may worship me. And so let's zoom into these words, my son. Now notice that God didn't just address Israel as my people, as if a king claiming control over his subjects. God didn't just, you know, say that, you know, I'm the owner, you are my possession. Now, if God used that kind of uh, term, I mean, of course, we are subject to God, of course. We are God's people, of course. But God does not just use terms that is very, how to say, very hard. Or I'm the owner, you are the possession, you therefore listen to me. But so, because when you use those terms, I'm the king, you are the subject, it sounds like there's no love, uh, no much intimacy in between. But God used very loving and endearing terms, father and son relationship. And the amazing thing about this father and son relationship is what? That God is not ashamed to call Israel his people, to call us his people, even though, even though what? Even though Israel, Israelites, they were the despised group in the eyes of Egyptian, in the eyes of the world. They are just what? They are just slaves. Now, if you're a parent, you know. Uh, I mean, of course, all parents love the children, right? But if the child is first in class, you'll be very proud. This is my child, you know. He's the first in class. But if your child is always the last in class, always uh, being called to the principal's office, always uh, failing the test, you'll be a bit shy to say that this is you. Or maybe you say very softly. You may not proclaim, you know, this is my child. I'm the father or I'm the mother. But this, this Israelites, they were the despised group in people, in the in the eyes of people of the world. They were slaves, they were shepherds who were despised by the Egyptians. And so in the same way, you and I, we are not very remarkable. We may not be very remar remarkable in this world. 
We may not be very successful. We are just very ordinary people. Uh, but God bothers to call us his children and say that he is our God, we are his people. And worse still, we are not just not very successful in this world. There are more successful people than us in this world. But what is worse? We also have disgraced and dishonored and angered God with our sins and transgressions, repeated sins and transgression, repeated idolatry. But yet, God is not ashamed to consider us who believe in Christ his children. For God's case, you know, when he said that Israel is my firstborn son, my son, when he said this, he already knew that Israelites, while living in Egypt, a lot of them have already turned their hearts to idols. I mean, if you read from Ezekiel chapter 20, you will see that over there, God rebuked his people. Why do you turn to the Egyptian idols? Why do you not let go of the Egyptian idols? But the beautiful thing is, although God already knew that his people's heart is so astray, has already departed from him, but still he said that Israel was his son and he still loved Israel as a father. And so all this that God has um, done for the for the for his people is purely out of God's love and one very important thing, out of God's covenant faithfulness. So we need to really re, uh, remember this when we think about God's relationship with us also, because what applies to Israel as God's people and God's son also apply to us as God's children. As God's children, we may be unworthy, we may have fall short of God's grace many times, but. It's not because we are worthy, but out of God's grace. And another very important, important thing, out of God's faithfulness to what? To his own covenant. He cannot default his own covenant. He cannot turn away from his own covenant. So out of his love, out of his covenant faithfulness, he continues to see us as his child. So Israel is slave to Egypt, but Israel is son to God. So in the same way, we also used to be slaves to sin, to the world, to the devil. But today, after believing in Christ, we are children of God. So we need to know that you know, if, despite being a child of God, Satan is like Pharaoh, as stubborn as Pharaoh. So you realize that uh, before we are Christians and even after we become Christians, you can see, you can sense and experience the stubbornness of Satan. You know, a lot of times we encounter in our faith living how desperately the devil tries all means to get a hold on us, to turn our attention from God, turn our heart away from God, and keep us from following God. But one thing we need to note is, no matter how stubborn Satan is, even if he's as stubborn as this Pharaoh, God has a way to deal with Satan and break through all his uh, opposition. So when we think about uh, you know how stubborn our spiritual enemy, the devil, is. Let us not be discouraged. Because why? Just like you know, the Israelites now. I believe before the Israelites gone through the ten plagues, they may feel very disheartened. You know, they are now a slave, being worked very hard by the Egyptian. They see no light. They see no way. They so they see no possibility in getting free one day because they also know how stubborn this Pharaoh is. So in the same way, sometimes as some of us, we walk with God. I don't, I don't know whether you feel that kind of hopelessness, disappointment in your life also. Now, sometimes when we follow God, we also feel like you know, we are so tightly bound by certain sins. We are so tightly bound by certain recurring evil thoughts. We are so, uh, certainly so strongly bound by a lot of problems, you know, a lot of repeated problems come into our life until the point we sort of feel it's not possible for me to come out from this recurring sin. It's not possible for my problems in life to stop because my enemy is so strong. He just refused to let me go. But God is trying to encourage us through what he did to the Israelites, through Moses, that in God's sovereign grace, in God's sovereign power, those whom he wants to set free, he will indeed eventually set free. I mean, of course, to you and I, while we were stuck in this um, hardship or in this struggle with sin, sometimes we ask ourselves, we also cannot understand why will God bother to save us? We don't know how exactly can God save us from our recurring problem. These are not the questions we can answer because God 
he just saves whoever he wants to save. God, he has his own way. But we can only ask, how can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? You know, this song, although it's a hymn, sometimes when I question, why God, you're so nice to me? Why God, do you bother to save me? This hymn, and can it be that I should gain? Uh, always ring in my mind the lyrics because we cannot ask why, why God you choose me. We cannot ask God how, how is it possible for, for you to get me out of this trouble? But we can only ask, how can it be? How can it be that God you, are, you indeed saved me in the end? So we can only be grateful if we belong to the group of people whom God showed his mercy to. And so here we see that God, out of his faithfulness, he still calls the unfaithful Israel his son. But we really need to understand, what is the purpose of God trying to free his people right now? So God, we are very happy right, to get freedom, to be set free. But we need to understand why. What is the purpose of God setting us free, setting the Israelite free? So here, uh, the verse also tells us, Let my son go, what? So he may worship me. So in other words, you and I, we are being set free by God so that we are freed to worship and to serve God. So when we read this verse, then it comes to our mind, it reveals to us what? That the opposite of bondage and slavery is what? We always thought that the opposite of slavery, the opposite of bondage is freedom. Is that, tr is that fully right? Half right. The opposite of, fully, uh, the opposite of bondage and slavery it's not independent freedom. And the word independent is there. Because we always think that, oh, when we are set free, we are totally free to do what we want. But here, yes, when God set us free, it is a kind of freedom. But it is not the kind of freedom to be self-governing. Why? Because you and I, we are sin sinners. When we are sinners, we have the sinful nature. And so when we are given the free reign, in our sinful nature, what will we choose? Will we naturally choose God or we will choose to indulge our flesh and gratify our sinful nature? And so because we are sinful and we have the sinful nature, it's not possible and sensible for God to set us free so that we be self-governing. So the truth is what? The truth is when God sets us free, it is indeed a kind of freedom. But it's the freedom from an evil master called the devil, called the sin, God sets us free from an evil one so that we can serve the best, the most loving, and the good Lord, Jesus himself. So here, when God tells Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, set my son Israelite free so that they can worship me, it means that the Israelites now, I mean in future, when they are freed from Pharaohs, they are not free to do what they want to do. They are not free to be their own master because if you read the book of Judges, when the Israelites did Everyone did what is right in their own eyes. What happened? A lot of evil happens and a lot of sins abound. So in the same way, we are being a Christian. It doesn't mean that, oh, now we are Christians, we are safe already, and henceforth, we can live as we please. We can be our own master. No, God says you are set free to worship God, not to obey yourself, not to be your own master. And that's why just now, did we read just now? Oh, yeah, just now I think we read Romans chapter 6. Um, there's this verse, we used to be slaves of sin. So you have been set free from sin, but now you have become slaves to righteousness. And so this is something we need to understand, God's purpose. When he set us free, the reason why God removed certain obstacles, you know, certain bondages in our life, a lot of times we lamented, right? We say, God, we are bound by sin. We are bound by worry. We are bound by a lot of things of the world. But when God removed those hindrances, when God removed those obstacles, his point is he removed all those unnecessary things and burdens so that what? So that we can serve him better. So that we can serve him with, without any baggages, without any hindrances. And so if we have been saved by God, our prayer now is, oh, not yeah, now we are free from the devil's reign, but our prayer should be, how can we present ourselves? as a living sacrifice to God. Now, if we are delighted to be called a child of God, now a lot of people like to be called a child of God. We like to say, oh, you're the blessed, favored one. You're the favored child of God. If we are delighted to be called a child of God, 
Then in the same light, we need to ask ourselves, are we also delighted to serve the God who is a much better master than sin and the devil? A lot of people, they like to be called a child of God. But when they are told that the child of God needs to serve God, wow, they're very, they're very sien. They, they, they say, huh? follow God, still must attend church. Follow God, still must give offering. Follow God, still must love people. Follow God, very troublesome. You know, sometimes they... But you think about it. If no matter what, we still have to serve a master. It's either we serve flesh, who will always do us more and more harm and give us less and less satisfaction. If we are to serve the world, it will only bring us maybe tempor temporary joy, but a lot of disappointment. So if, if at any point, we, no matter what, we still have to serve one master, then we should be delighted to serve the good God rather than to serve sin, to serve the devil, who will give us no good returns. So this should be our prayer after being set free by God. And then next, very importantly, because God knows that God already make it very clear that after being set free from sin, we are not to continue to serve sin. And that's why, importantly, the next point is, after being caught by God, whether it's caught to be his children, caught to be his servant like Moses, after being caught by God, it does not mean then that you know, God will tolerate our unresolved sin. So we continue to read verse 24. Now at the lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses. Okay, so this verse is actually a bit complicated. This NIV name Moses, but in fact, in the original text, uh, the word is just him. So this him makes the whole verse very confusing because the him can refer to Moses, can also refer to Moses' son, as we'll read later. But because as we read from beginning to now, from the beginning of chapter 4 all the way to this point, verse 24, it's always been talking on uh, talking about Moses. Moses has been the object that is being mentioned. So it's very highly likely that this hymn refers to Moses. So the person whom God wants to kill is Moses. So at the lodging place on the way, God met the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah, so Zipporah is uh, Moses' wife, took a fling knife, cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses. Now this Moses also is supposed to be his. So you don't know, is it touch Moses' feet or touch the son's feet? And then touch the feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. And at that time, so the, to help us understand a little bit better, the writer of the Bible bracket this. At that time, the wife, Zipporah, said, Bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Okay, so this account is very... A lot of people say these are the three weirdest verses and most uh, and the hardest verses in the Bible to um, to make sense of. So here we read something very strange. Why? Why is it strange? Because God just sent Moses on a very important mission. Has Moses completed that mission? Haven't even started, right? And God took pains. You know, God spent a, a considerable amount of time trying to persuade Moses. You know, don't be scared. You know, just go, just go. I I will I will be with you. Don't, don't, uh, don't have so much hesitation. So God took a lot of pains to finally, uh, to finally persuade Moses to go on this mission. And before the mission even started, God wanted to kill his agent. So it sounds a bit unthinkable, right? So strange. What is God trying to do? And usually, you know, uh, we, when we pray to God, or when we think about God, our common human mindset will be what? We will be thinking, if God still has a plan for us, if God still has a use for us, now some, sometimes we are afraid of dying, you know, when are we going to die? But sometimes, when we know that God still has a purpose for me on earth, when we sort of know that God still has a use for me on earth, then we, we are more assured, you know, God, I know that like, you won't bring me to heaven so fast yet, you know, because you, you still have things for me to do on earth. But here is very strange. God clearly has something for Moses to finish on earth. Why is it that he wanted to kill Moses right now? So it's very hard for us to understand, right? And so the, the passage gave us a clue. The reason has got to do a little bit with circumcision. So I, I believe circumcision is not uh, a strange term to all of us here. But just now in the responsive reading, we sort of know the background to circumcision. Because when God made a covenant with Abraham, God clearly told Abraham that every male in the Israelite family must be circumcised because if anyone in Israel is not circumcised, 
there is severe consequences because that person, that uncircumcised person, will be cut off from his people. And so why is circumcision so important to the Israelites? Because it represents being set apart. Circumcision represents being dedicated to God. And circumcision is what? It's actually a sign of being in the covenant of God. And so circumcision is so important. But what's the problem? Either Moses or his son is not, or both of them has not been circumcised. Now, there's a lot of interpretation to, is it Moses is not fully circumcised, or is it the son who is not fully circumcised, or both of them are not circumcised? So I will not go into all this. Um, uh, it's a lot of things, but generally, generally, why this verse is so unclear is because, as I mentioned, the subject, uh, not subject, the object him, we don't know is Moses or the son. And also the bridegroom of blood, this term, uh, it is a phrase very common back then in that generation. But in the modern culture, as we trace back, nobody can get an absolute understanding of what is meant by a bridegroom of blood. And so whatever the case is, whether it's Moses, whether it's the son not circumcised, one thing we need to understand also, uh, when the Bible didn't make things very clear, in, in its contents, it means we don't have to lose sleep over that also, you know, because the crux of the matter, the learning point for us is not, oh, is it Moses not circumcised or the son not circumcised? But the learning point for us is what? Whether it's Moses himself not circumcised, which is quite unlikely because if you recall, Moses stayed how long with his Levite parents? Three months. Being Levites, they understood the importance of circumcision. So my personal point is, it's very likely that Moses would have been circumcised because he stayed with his parents for three months. So, all the other alternative, this verse could mean that Moses' son is not circumcised. But whichever the case, whether it's the father not circumcised or the ma uh, not, not mother uh, or the son not circumcised, God's point is his command of circumcision must be taken seriously. And when Moses didn't uh, take it seriously, whether it's for himself or for his son, God wanted to even kill Moses for this purpose. But why? Why especially Moses? Because who is Moses? What is Moses' future role? In future, Moses is going to be the one who delivered God's law to, to the Israelites. Moses is, is to be the prophet of God's law. It's to, it, Moses is supposed to teach God's law to Israelites. And how can he himself treat God's law with such contempt? And so God is right now trying to teach Moses that if you want to serve the Lord, not just Moses, Moses and his family, they must obey God's commandment. Because if Moses cannot even lead his family to follow God faithfully, how can Moses lead the whole nation effectively, right? And only when Moses himself obeyed God's commandments, then he can be a good example and he can lead the rest of Israelites well to follow God's covenant. And so, of course, so that's the logic. So God, when, when God did something, it's not for, not for no reason. Of course, for, for you and I today, we are modern day believers. We do not need physical, physical circumcision. But also the, the spirit of it applies. If we want to serve God and have victory in our mission, we also need to ask ourselves, have we undergone the circumcision of our heart? So in other words, what is the circumcision of our heart? Of course, first of all, have we given our heart to God and commit to Him and no other gods and commit to follow Him? Also, circumcision of our heart also means, circumcision means set apart, right? So we have also to ask, when we claim that we are a Christian, are our perspective, our belief, our values in life, our methodologies in how to deal with events of life are those different or set apart from people of the world. So this is something we need to ask ourselves. If we want to serve God effectively, you will realize that if we are not circumcised in our heart, if we are half-hearted, if we want to follow the world halfway, follow God halfway, you realize that we won't be able to be an effective witness and servant of God. And also, so one thing, what, so when we want to uh, fulfill God's mission, well, one question, do we, are we circumcised in our heart? And the next question we need to ask is, do we have any lingering or certain unresolved entangling sin like Moses had? 
So sometimes, uh, you know, we humans, we are very, we are by nature very defensive. We, our, nat our natural instinct is to protect ourselves. So in order to protect ourselves, we tend to do what? We tend to trivialize sin. So a lot of times, we trivialize sins by, by what? By defining sin to be just a weakness. Of course, we have been hearing that you know, God can use weakness. God can use us in our weakness to fulfill His will. Of course, God can do that. When we have weakness in terms of maybe I'm not so eloquent, maybe I'm a bit more timid, maybe uh, I'm not so educated, etc. You know, all these are not sinful weakness. But there's no such thing as a sinful weakness. You know, some people say this is just a sinful weakness, a weakness of sin. There's no such thing as this. Uh, a sin is a sin. So by dealing with Moses so harshly, God is trying to tell us that a sin is a sin. We cannot, uh, you know, pretend that that sin is a weakness and uh, it's just an inadequacy, it's a flaw. This circumcision is just a flaw in the family. We cannot just pretend that it's just a weakness, a little thing, and continue to sin, you know, wow, God, you can use us in witnesses, you can use inadequate sinners, and therefore I can continue to, to lie, to steal, to be lazy, etc. So God highlights to us that sin has uh, grave consequences. And so when we know that God's intention is He wants us to turn away from our sin and right our wrong so that we will be able to serve God effectively. Because otherwise you realize if we allow sin, unresolved sin to remain in our life, that will always be a foothold for devil. And ever we want to advance for God, whenever we want to serve God, that lingering sin will always be a foothold for the devil to drag us back. And so God tells us, do not ignore sin. Do not see sin just as a very little problem. It's something to be dealt with. Otherwise, God will come after us. I mean, of course, God will have mercy. So you see that when, even when God wanted to kill, I say wanted to kill, God knows he wouldn't really kill, but he just want to warn Moses. And God, when he gave that warning, the beautiful part about God uh, disciplining us and warning us is he gave enough reaction time for remedy. So he gave Zipporah just enough time for Zipporah to do the, the right thing to salvage the whole situation. So when God comes to us to give us a warning, God, in fact, he don't really want to kill us. I mean, a father won't kill the, the child, but he just wants us to turn from our sin quickly, repent and do the right thing. And so finally, the last point for today is after dealing with Moses' unsettled sin, then Moses is ready to advance for onward to this, to this mission. And so after God settled the lingering sin, this unresolved sin of Moses and his family, God then fulfilled his promise to, to give Moses co-workers to help him along in this mission. So verse 27, The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. Verse 29, Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed, just as God said, right? They will believe. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Now, before I talk about the co-workers that God has prepared for Moses, I want to draw our attention first to the one amazing thing of the elders and the people's worship. Now, I ask you, when you read this verse, what is the reason for the elders and the people's worship of God? Why? Why are they worshiping, worshiping God? They are worshiping God simply because they believe that God was concerned about them and have seen their misery. But are they still in their problems? Are their problems solved already? Uh, were they still slaves? Were they still in uh, terrible times? Yes, they are still slaves. Their problem has not turned better immediately. But the beautiful thing is they didn't wait for things to become better before they worship God. They didn't wait until they were set free. They really, uh, they really left Egypt and they praised God. The beautiful thing is what? They worship God as they wait. Now, this is the hardest thing for us to do, right? 
But yet this is something, if we are able to master this mystery, we'll be the happiest Christian on earth. Because a lot of times, the human response is what? It's not I praise God and worship God as I wait. Our human response tends to be, I want to wait and see. See whether I get the uh, outcomes I desired, see whether I get what I prayed for, and then after that I worship God. That's the, that's the common human tendency, right? But what is so beautiful part, uh, beautiful about this worship of the people is, they are still waiting. You know, oh, now I know God is concerned about us. Now I know uh, God has seen our misery. But as, it, as they are waiting for God's deliverance, they already bow down and worship God. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, are we also able to worship God, to praise God as we wait? As we wait for a marriage, as we wait for a, a child, as we wait for a health test result, as we wait, as we wait for a, a sickness to be cured, etc. Are we able to worship God already in the waiting process just simply by knowing that God cares for us? God sees our misery. God knows our situation. Our situation is not fixed yet. I'm still miserable, but God sees my sorrow. So are we able to worship God just simply because of that? So this is a question we need to reflect and pray about. Okay, so having said that, now the last part of the message is we draw our attention to what God has provided for Moses to equip him, to get him ready for his uh, mission forward. So as what God has promised, we saw things happening and unfolding because here what we read just now is Aaron indeed helped Moses and the elders and people indeed supported and believed Moses. So in fact, what is God trying to prove to Mo Moses here? And a lot of times God is trying to prove to us also that in fact, our worries in the first place are not necessary because Moses, he's afraid that he cannot speak well. He's afraid that the people don't believe him. But here we read that God resolved all this for him easily. It's so easy for God. But when we keep looking at ourselves, we are always intimidated. So God is trying to highlight to Moses and also highlight to us many of our fears, many of our worries are indeed not necessary because when we turn to God, if God wants to do something, he will, he will remove unnecessary obstacle. He will give us what we need. And so here we see God provided exactly what Moses needs. He provided him with co-workers of Aaron and especially Aaron's mouth and the support of the elders and the people. And so God opened ways for the people to accept Moses as their leader. And so in that sense, God what? God actually paved the way for Moses to carry out God's mission. And this is what we will read the next time in chapter 5, where Aaron and Moses, they really go and find Pharaoh and speak to Pharaoh. But here today, as we consolidate today's sharing and today's learning point, uh, this is a long passage. But to consolidate, what are the learning points for us today is what? After hearing from God, after God speaks to us, God expects immediate follow-up obedience. But we need to know that even though we obey God and do His will, we may still face problems. We may still face resistance. But God already prepared us that to be godly is a challenging path. But God keeps telling us, if we press on, if we keep on laboring, we keep on believing, God will prove to us that our labor in Christ will not be in vain. And also we know that our God is what kind of God? Our God is the God who hardens who he wants to harden. But we thank God that he also has mercy on who he wants to have mercy. And when God withhold his judge, uh, when God withhold his mercy on the sinner, he is not unjust because God owes no sinner any mercy. But if we are the one who receive God's mercy, all we can do is to be really thankful and committed to follow God even more. And so that's why we need to understand when God saves us, when God has mercy on us, when God frees us, it is not to live as we please because we are supposed to serve God as our new and best master. And in order to serve God effectively, God wants us to resolve our unsettled sins. Do not let our unsettled sin to be a hold back, to be an effective servant and witness of God. And finally, we can be assured that if God sends us on a mission, God will also provide the necessary support, co-workers, even open the ways that we need Him to open for us. 
So I pray that this whole passage today will turn our hearts, what? To obey God after we hear from Him. To obey God after we know Him. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for giving us your word today. Lord, we know that it is easy to hear you and then sit on it. Because sometimes what we hear from you is very hard for us to do. Or sometimes what we hear from you is not aligned with our own desires and therefore we do not want to do. But Lord, we pray that through um, the story of Moses, we pray that Holy Spirit help us to produce this heart of obedience to you and to know that when we obey you, Lord, you open ways for us. You clear our doubts, you clear our fears, and you convince us that our hesitations are all unnecessary. So Lord, I pray for this heart of obedience in everyone here. We pray for the effect of your word to turn our hearts to you, to turn our hearts away from our own master of sin, of self, of the world, and of the devil. Lord, help us see that when we submit to you, our best master, we will have the highest joy and satisfaction. So Lord, I thank you, and I pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Mm-hmm.